life continue to seek to find new solutions and innovative ways to save lives here in Ohio. Which brings me to the reason we're here tonight. Our speaker, born in Mumbai, India, Dinesh D'Souza, came to the United States as an exchange student and graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Dartmouth College in 1983. A former policy analyst in the Reagan White House, he also served as a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and as a fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. He served as the president of King's College in New York City from 2010 until 2012. Our guest this evening has authored over 15 books, 10 of which made the New York Times bestseller list, three of those being number one. I will tell you in the back, he was gracious enough. I, I had several pages here of uh, uh, biographical background, and I'm like, do you really want me to read all of this? And he's like, no, get rid of that page and this page and just say a few of these other things. So we're, we're going to skip ahead a few pages, and, and we'll get to the, uh, the good stuff and, and to his, uh, his comments, which is why we're all here tonight. In 2010, he wrote The Roots of Obama's Rage, which, described, which was described as the most influential political book of the year. His second analysis of Obama came in his 2012 book, Obama's America, Unmaking the American Dream, which was one of those three books to climb to the number one slot on the New York Times bestseller list. Two years later, in 2014, he wrote his next book, America, Imagine the World Without Her, which also became a number one bestseller. His latest film, which I believe we are all familiar with, Hillary's America, exposes Planned Parenthood's many assaults on the human person, highlighting their founder's racism and the organization's allegiance to the horrific practice of abortion. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in for a treat tonight. Won't you please join me in welcoming Dinesh D'Souza. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am um, very honored and delighted to be here. I want to thank um, Right to Life for inviting me. I, um, these days, with the, with the election, I seem to be doing a lot of political speeches, um, still doing quite a bit of stuff on the campus. And uh, it's only a few times that I speak uh, at Right to Life, but it's always uh, a special privilege because um, yours is a movement that is virtually unique in the give and take of American interest group politics. Typically, if I'm speaking to a trade association or a business group, they want something. They want lower taxes, or they want deregulation, or they want to reduce the size of government. And in American politics on both sides, groups generally exist to fight for something that they want, something tangible, something material. And if you look at the other side of this issue, the, someone mentioned the abortion industry, that's an industry fighting for itself, fight, fighting for its own privileges. But then you have um, the pro-lifer fighting for what? This is the only movement that I can think of that's not fighting in the name of self-interest at all. This is a, a movement mobilized to fight for human beings who have not even been born. Uh, it is the, the most unselfish 
political cause in America today. Now, this by itself generates a kind of a puzzle. Um, abortion is clearly a profound human tragedy. When I was listening a moment ago, I was thinking to myself about the maternal instinct, and I was thinking to myself about the tragedy of abortion, and the tragedy of abortion is not that a woman kills a child. The tragedy of abortion is that a woman kills her own child. That makes this an unnaturally horrific act. And its horrificness and its evil is actually quite manifest. It's quite obvious in the act itself. No amount of Jesuitical debate about the origin of life can obscure the fact that this is, in fact, a life in the making, in the making. And the snuffing out of it can't possibly, in any moral compass at all, be considered a matter of political or personal indifference. What struck me about the debate yesterday, and in listening to Hillary's kind of impassioned outbursts on the subject, was not only was she defending abortion, but in talking about the sort of moral wrestling that goes on with an abortion, she was taking something inherently wrong and trying to make it into a virtue. In other words, she wasn't just defending it as a regrettable necessity imposed by some exigency of circumstance that makes it impossible to do anything else. She actually thought that it was, under given circumstances, a morally right choice. It, it threw my mind back, actually, to the slavery debate of the early 19th century. Um, you know, in, in the movie Hillary's America, we talk about how the Democrats were, for 50 years, the party of slavery. Now, again, the Democrats obviously didn't invent slavery. Slavery's been going on since the dawn of mankind. But there was something new about slavery in the 19th century and about the Democratic Party's role in it that's very illuminating for the abortion debate, and that is, for the first time, slavery began to be defended as a positive good. Aristotle, in the 5th century BC, defends slavery, but he defends slavery as a matter of necessity. He basically says that some people can't govern themselves, and he also says that in a, in, a, in a civilized society, there's a lot of art, there's a lot of culture, somebody has to do the dirty work, and therefore we have slaves. But in the 19th century, for the first time, the Democratic Party invented the idea that slavery is not only good for the master, everybody knows that, it's good for the slave. And this was something quite new. Now, I, I mentioned the slavery debate, and I'm going to come back to it in a minute, because my own interest in the pro-life cause, I came from, the, from India to the United States, and I read a book years ago that drew me irresistibly into, the, into this issue, even though the book had nothing to do with abortion. It was actually a study of the, the Lincoln-Douglas debates for the Senate seat in Illinois. And what struck me was that when you listen to the arguments between Lincoln and Douglas arguing about slavery, they are identical not only in substance, but very nearly in form to the debate about abortion now. So Douglas, the Democrat, argues that each state, each community, should decide for itself if it wants slavery. Douglas basically says, I'm not for slavery, but I think in a big society, in a big country, people are going to disagree about it. 
So let's agree to disagree. Let's create a political framework in which people who have irreconcilable differences on this issue can nevertheless get along. Douglas's idea was called popular sovereignty. Let each community make up its own mind and vote up or vote down on whether it wants slavery. In other words, this was the inventor of what we can call the pro-choice position. The pro-choice position not for an individual, but for a community. But nevertheless, Douglas says that the fate of the slave is in the hands of a political community deciding to choose one way or the other. Now, what's very interesting about all this is, is Lincoln's answer to this, which is that Lincoln says, look, no system of democracy is possible without some form of choice. The people do have to choose. But he goes, you can't have choice without reference to the content of the choice. No choice can be made without looking at what it is that is actually being chosen. And Lincoln says that if you are actually choosing as a community to enslave another guy, then you are using choice to cancel out his choice. And that you can't do. That is actually something that is not only immoral, but a violation of that inalienable right that every human being has to life and to freedom. So here is this debate that's going on in the middle of the 19th century. And as I say, it's about slavery. But it occurred to me that in it, not only do you have the logic of the so-called pro-choice position stated clearly and dramatically, but you have the rebuttal to it also given in the context of slavery, but fully applicable to the challenges that we see today. I've been watching the, from, from a distance and somewhat from the outside, because most of my career has been in Christian apologetics, it's been in politics. But here we have Roe versus Wade, 1973. I came to the United States five years later, in 1978, at the age of 17. And it's now been, well, well over a generation. 40 years, almost half a century. And in that intervening time, we have seen a massive pileup of casualties. The number of unborn children, a mountain of them. And if you were to count each soul and add it up, it would seem to amount to a, a kind of a holocaust. And the question I want to ask is, if the abortion argument is so obvious, and if the pro-life cause is so right, how has this happened? Why is it the case that even now, fighting to overturn Roe versus Wade, why is it that even now, trying to establish the sanctity of life, the preciousness of life, and getting the law and the culture to recognize that, why is that such an uphill struggle? It's not as if the arguments for pro-life lack clarity. Yesterday we heard references to the Constitution. And um, what's remarkable is that while the Second Amendment is clearly and explicitly stated in the Constitution, the right to abortion can't be found anywhere in it. I don't know if you have a copy of the Constitution, but you might consider not only reading it, but hold it up to the light, squeeze lemon juice on it, read it back to front. You won't see it. It's not in there. So where is this fictitious right? And people say, well, the Constitution evolves because that's because circumstances change. Well, what are the new circumstances that we have today that would justify us making this kind of a change? People say, well, I don't know if the unborn are really, if they have constitutional rights, I'm not sure we have a full human being. 
Well, even if that were the case, even if you weren't sure, one would think that you'd give it the benefit of the doubt. I mean, no one says, well, I'm out hunting, and I saw a movement behind a bush, and I wasn't sure if it was a deer or another hunter, so I opened fire. If you aren't sure, you one would think that you'd err on the side of caution. And yesterday, we heard Hillary talk about the need to get the government out and let people make private decisions. Now, isn't it paradoxical that a political party that wants the government involved in every other thing, from health care to child care to this to that, on this issue, suddenly has a blaze of libertarian insight. And isn't it uh, more than ironic that a political movement dedicated to the idea of compassion, compassion is its watchword, and social justice, which has been fighting to extend the definition of compassion in every other area outward. Let's count the illegal immigrant. Let's count the refugee from Syria. All these people who might be normally quite distant from the radius of ordinary compassion, let's expand the defi definition to include them. Let's include the snail darter. But when it comes to the unborn, somehow this radius, these parameters of compassion don't extend that far. They mysteriously stop. They mysteriously stop. So what the heck is going on here? I was, um, about a year ago, I spoke at a pro-life event, and there was a woman there who had a sheaf of dramatic and quite uh, startling photographs of various stages of abortion, and she was showing them to me, and she basically made this, the statement, if every American could see this, there would be no more abortion in our country. Because people would be face-to-face, -face, up front, unavoidably, with the truth, a truth that human nature sometimes tries to duck and avoid, but nevertheless, here it is, and how can you continue the way you have been when you now know? It's one thing when you don't know, but now you do. And I remember that stuck with me, and in the subsequent weeks, um, I began to toss this question in my head uh, to ask, is it really the case that if by some media breakthrough we could make a documentary film on the pro-life cause, make it mandatory viewing in every school, have every American see it, would in fact a culture and a climate be created in which Roe versus Wade would essentially be finished? And I don't fully know the answer to that question, but I suspect that that won't do it. And I want to think for a moment about why, and I want to think about it by stepping back and trying to look at the way in which our culture has shifted um, in the last 40 years, in the years since Roe versus Wade. Because it looks to me that what's going on in America today, and you see this very much, I got a, you got a glimpse of this with Hillary last night, her determination on this issue. She wants to draw a line in the sand. Even when the issue of partial birth abortion came up, it didn't shake her. Her point was, if this is not for the health of the mother, I'm not even going to look at it. What is Hillary actually saying, if you could translate, read between the lines, sort of decode the ethics under what she's arguing? I think what she's trying to say, and she won't say it, is something like this. Abortion is the debris of the sexual revolution. If you have a sexual revolution, you're gonna have a whole bunch of unwanted pregnancies, one way or the other. And if you're gonna have a bunch of unwanted pregnancies, we need abortion to, quote, take care of them. To question abortion is actually to put the sexual revolution itself into question. That I am not willing, she is not willing to do. In other words, 
She sees this as a part of an irreversible social change, and she sees it as part of progress. Progress. And that's why she is a progressive. It's important to realize that when people say things like progress, you shouldn't be lulled because you have to ask progress in what direction? What counts for you as progress? How do you define it? For a lot of the progressives, they define progress as centralizing the power of the federal government and then placing themselves in charge of, the fe of that government. This to them is progress. Anything that moves away from this is opposing progress. So this is the old Marxist used to say, if you're going to make an omelet, you have to break a few eggs. And it may be that we have reached a point in our culture where there is a powerful constituency that sees abortion in that light. No amount of convincing is going to do it because they view the pro-life cause literally as turning back the clock. Now, this turning black the clock business brings me to something else that has shifted in, in the very time that I've been in this country, the last 30 to 35 years, and that is the belief in an external moral order. So let's think about this for a minute. From American history from the beginning, right until, you may say, yesterday, not so long ago, all Americans, almost without exception, believed that there is an external moral order in the universe that is independent of us and makes claims on us. Think of something like the Ten Commandments as reflecting this external moral code. Now, this is not to say that everybody lives up to the code, but it is to say that the code supplies a, an acknowledged and shared moral standard for the whole society. And part of that code as, is the dignity of life, the preciousness of life. Remember Jefferson, when he talked about rights, speaks of the right to life, and he speaks of rights as created. We get them from our creator. That's, that's by the way, why they're inalienable. Normally, if something is yours, you can sell it. But you can't sell yourself into slavery because in some profound sense, you don't own yourself. So this is Jefferson, and this is this kind of unbroken line from the beginning all the way into the 20th century. And it didn't matter in America if you're a Jew or if you're a Christian or a believer, even a non-believer. If you went to an American and said, hey, do you agree the Ten Commandments is a good way to live? Almost everybody would go, well, yeah. So what has actually changed in our culture since then? because something very profound has changed, and you can see it, and you see it in the popular culture. What has changed isn't that Americans today, and, or young people, some people go, well, young people have just rejected morality. No, you can't actually reject morality. In fact, if you think about it, morality is a part of what it means to be human. If some human being doesn't have morality at all, we kind of have a name for such a person. It's a sociopath. You can't even be locked up for your crimes because you don't know the difference between right and wrong. Those people are very few. Unfortunately, one of them may be running for president, but that's a different story. <laughs> no. My, my bigger point is that what we've seen in the culture is a shift from the external moral code to the to morality now coming from the inner self. In other words, we're seeing this idea that our, our children have, young people, that morality isn't out there. It's in here. And the self becomes the sort of adjudicator and promulgator of a morality that is for me. This isn't pure relativism, because it's not like anything goes, but it's more like there's an inner being inside of me that arbitrates right and wrong. I don't have to go to my preacher or my teacher, not even God. I just need to dig in myself 
Now, I say this because all of this creates a completely new way of understanding morality. And it's important for us because we are missionaries in a moral cause. We're trying to convince people to think a certain way and to do a certain thing. And to do that, we have to speak to them where they are. In my own career, I was, um, for most of my career, kind of a, a think tank guy at the Hoover Institution at AEI, the American Enterprise Institute in Washington. Uh, and I was kind of a writer and speaker. And only four years ago, I kind of I got the idea that, look, I'm, I'm just reaching this, a, a, a limited audience, and the ideas of the left are very powerfully promulgated in the three big megaphones of our culture, namely academia, Hollywood, and the media. People watch our movie, and they go, and I make startling statements in the film. I say in 1860, the year of, um, of the Civil War, no Republican owned a slave. All the slaves in the country, four million of them, were owned by Democrats. Now, that's a kind of a, an eye-opener, and it's pretty easy to refute if you can simply give me a list of 10 Republicans who own slaves. But no one can, because there weren't any. So, but how is it possible that everybody doesn't know this? This is a topic that is taught in schools, it's something that's talked about in society. How is it the case that the, the stuff in our movies is like, wow, I never knew that? Well, the answer is that because the progressive left is dominant in media, in academia, in Hollywood, they can put out a lot of propaganda, a lot of disinformation. And even if you knew differently, you wouldn't have a big enough megaphone to counter them. So, as a movement, the pro-life cause is not only facing a, an assault in the political domain, but also in the larger cultural domain. And remember that in the culture, many issues are settled long before they even get to politics. Look at the gay marriage debate for a minute. And ask yourself, how did that issue switch so quickly, seemingly overnight. It almost seemed like one day all of America thought gay marriage was kind of an out there, wild, and somewhat ridiculous idea. And suddenly, it's mainstream, and political candidates can appeal to it, and it's difficult to oppose it. How did that happen? Well, it turns out that it happened because for 25 years, only one side was fighting. It's kind of like one hand clapping. So the gay marriage debate on the left began when Ellen came out of the closet, and Will and Grace, and 300 sitcoms. And so by the time the issue actually became one of a political decision, it was a fait accompli, it was a done deal. And this is how the other side fights. It's got terrifying weapons at its disposal, and it's got huge megaphones. And this is kind of the reason I decided to pivot into movies. One day I thought to myself, I mean, I remember that Michael Moore had made the movie Fahrenheit 9-11 and dropped it in the middle of the 2004 campaign. I mean, an unbelievably moronic movie. Which kind of got me thinking, if that guy can do it, how hard can it be? Now, Movies are powerful because they appeal to the head and the heart. Movies engage all the senses. If you think about when you read a book, it appeals to your mind. Your mind is constructing the ideas in the book as it reads. If you watch a play, it mainly appeals to your ear. Because on a stage, there's only so much you can show, and so it's all dependent on the dialogue. In a movie, a movie is mainly not only a visual, but an emotional experience. And so movies are a very powerful way to communicate not only ideas, but feelings. Feelings. We're in the very last days of an election. Is there a way for Trump to win? I think one way for him to win would be to take DVDs of the movie. By the way, we have some outside. 
that just, just came out a week ago, and dropped them in the mailboxes of the three to five million swing voters in about seven states. It's a very doable thing. I can't do it, but Trump and the RNC, the super PACs, they have the addresses of all these voters. Now, I mention this because this is called using your influence in a laser-like way. Many times in politics, we don't use our influence. We use very little of it. And the little of it is used sometimes as a blunt instrument. It needs to be used in an effective way. And it can be. Um, I'll, I'll tell an anecdote from a couple of years ago to illustrate how influence can be used effectively. Because this is something worth keeping in mind. We don't know what political environment lies ahead. We could actually be in for some tough times. I mean, you're like, tough times, what have we been living through now? But you, it could be that after Obama, we're in for something a little bit worse. And, and, you, and I say worse because Obama, at the end of the day, is an ideologue. He might be a, a confused ideologue, and his ideology, to my way of thinking, is pathetic and destructive. But poor man, he believes it. He has a vision. He thinks he's doing the right thing. The Clintons are more like Bonnie and Clyde. <laughs> Here's a question I wish that Trump had put to Hillary yesterday. Um, hey, Hillary, you know, as a builder, as a real estate guy, I've built a bunch of buildings, I've done real estate, and I've done very well for myself because I've actually built stuff. Now, you guys, you and Bill, were by your own acknowledgement dead broke when you left the White House. In these intervening few years, you have gone from zero to $300 million on a government salary. Now, how is that possible? How does someone actually do that? What, if I build buildings and that was my product, what product were you selling to enable you to get so much dough? Is it not a fact that the product was American foreign policy itself? And if that's the case, and you want to talk about what I as a private citizen said on a bus 10 years ago, isn't it true that your offenses are against the American public? They're against the public trust, and they're against the public treasury. You might wonder why issues like religious freedom and abortion, why do people who are on the make and on the take even care about any of this? I mean, if you think about it, traditionally, even dictators didn't care about the private lives of ordinary citizens. They didn't care what religion they practiced. Think of the old Roman Empire. They didn't particularly, if you left them alone, they didn't bother what you believed. You could be, you can belong to one of any religion that you want. You could do whatever sacrifices you want. So why do today's progressives want to meddle with us? It's important to know because sometimes as Christians or as conservatives, we go, oh, I'm so tired of politics. I just want to retreat into my own world. I just want to drive my pickup. I just want to go to church. I'm just going to, I'm just going to basically live my own life. And then it dawns on you, you can't. They won't let you. They're not content to let you do your thing. They want you to do their thing, their thing. And this is because for them, this centralized progressivism relies on stripping the uh, You have the individual naked and shivering, and you have the centralized state. And they want to bludgeon all the institutions in between. So all the zones of private community, little leagues, churches, all of these are threats to a centralized government because they are alternative sources of loyalty and allegiance. And so the people who truly want centralized power want you, us, completely dependent on them. In some ways, what, uh, what is really startling is they want to restore the old idea of the plantation. Remember the old slave plantation? And the slave plantation functioned because all the people on it were completely dependent. And if you think about the progressive agenda, oh, you even look at the progressive agenda as 
lived out in inner cities. That's what we see. Now, I was thinking about Margaret Sanger, watching Hillary, who got, she got the Margaret Sanger Award, you probably know, in 2009. And Hillary says very self-consciously that we should be inspired by Margaret Sanger and embrace her vision. Now, Hillary's not a dummy. She knows that Margaret Sanger was not about spacing your pregnancies. She knows that Margaret Sanger wasn't even about birth control. Po population's too high, let's control births. No. Margaret Sanger was about some people having more children and other people having less children. And who decides? Not the people themselves. No way. She decides. Society decides. Somebody else decides. And so Margaret Sanger's idea was that if you're white, if you're educated, if you're rich, you ought to have more children. She called that positive eugenics. But if you're dark-skinned, if you're black, if you're poor, you must have fewer children. Ideally by persuasion, but if not, forced sterilization is quite acceptable as an option as well. And Margaret Sanger's ideas, particularly about sterilizing delinquents and mental defectives, were adopted by the Nazis almost verbatim in the 1930s for their sterilization laws, which were not initially about the Jews. They were about de delinquents and mental defectives. And then as you know, and if you know if you watched our movie, Margaret Sanger had the Negro Project. The basic idea was to reduce the size of the Negro population. It's kind of what it says. So where is the Negro Project now? Well, the Negro Project still exists. And today it is called Planned Parenthood. Because it's not an accident today that if you go in the inner cities and you look, you go, that's where you see all these Planned Parenthood clinics, which are doing a thriving business. Now, I've gone on and I, I need to adopt the, the motto that King Henry VIII used with one of his wives. He said, I can't keep you too long. <laughs> so I want, to, I want to exhort you, whatever happens on election day, I certainly hope the Republicans win. I hope Trump wins. I hope the Republicans keep the House and the Senate. Um, Hey, just in case you're one of those never Trump guys, it's time to stop that. Yes. Um, um, and, and here's why, here's why. Um, the abolitionists who were the people of principle of the 19th century, and they stood on principle, and they, they were a kind of a moral beacon. But let's remember that the abolitionists did not end slavery. They never did, and they never could. Politically, they were ineffective. The only time abolitionism actually succeeded was when it integrated itself into the Republican Party. Who ended slavery? The Republican Party by winning the election of 1860 and by winning the, the Civil War. Similarly now, American politics is fought in teams. We all want to live in a world in which we're always choosing the good guy over the bad guy. And then we realize that in the real world, in foreign policy, no less than in our political system, we're often choosing between the bad guy and the really bad guy. And sometimes you have to ally with the bad guy to stop the worst guy. The same way we allied with Stalin, a bad guy, because another bad guy, Hitler, posed a greater threat at the time. Let us not, in the name of principle, commit the suicide of our own principles. Let's not actually get a government. That will assault life even more and take away our liberties even further. And sometimes when you think things are bad, they could get a lot worse. Abortion is bad. Government subsidy of abortion is worse. Forcing people to have an abortion is even worse. And we're not there but it is not out of the realm of possibility. So let's keep in mind the fact that we are trying to hold the country together. And we can make a real difference if we act effectively and creatively. 
long time ago, a professor of mine told me the story of the, li of the lion tamer and the lion. So here is the lion tamer with the stick, and here is the lion. And notice that the lion is obediently following the machinations of the lion tamer. And yet my professor poses an interesting question. He goes, who is actually more powerful, the lion tamer or the lion? Well, the lion. So why then is the lion so sycophantically and obediently allowing the lion tamer to call the shots? Why? And the answer is because the lion doesn't know its own power. The lion thinks that the lion tamer is more powerful. And that is our position. Here we are as citizens, as political activists, there's a lot we can do. And there are organizations like Ohio Right to Life that are doing them, that are actually standing in the fight on the front line. So there are things we can do, and there are groups that we need to support. But we don't often recognize our own power. We don't recognize that by deploying our energy and deploying our resources, we can actually make a huge difference. This is a very, to me, a very precarious moment for this country. It's only happened four or five times in American history. Normally, the country works great. Normally, you don't even need to know about the founding, just as the same as you don't need to know about the blueprints of your house. You just lie on the couch and walk in the halls. It's only when your house begins to shake and you go, oh, I better go in the attic, I better get the blueprints, I better figure out how this thing was put together. And this is one of those moments. By tragic necessity, it is our fate to be here as Americans when the moral compass, when the American dream itself hangs in the balance and depends, scary thought, on us. So let us prove that through our energy, our creativity, we are up to the challenge. Let us support organizations like this one that believe in our principles, and then, through prayer and through effort, God willing, we can help to save America. Thank you very much. Thank you.